Hi, today we're going to go over our art talk book and turn to page chapter one and we're going to be on page four. So what we use the art talk book for is a little bit of art history, learning how to talk about art vocabulary, learning different techniques, how to talk about artwork. And from that, you will have PowerPoints, they may have questions that you need to do from the book or from worksheets. And then we have vocabulary, but each time we read a chapter, we're going to then build up on that, our art vocabulary, and then work towards big projects. So each chapter is covering a little section that we'll be doing and also be working in units and everything. So the first couple is just having us learn how to talk about art and how to look at it. A lot of times we just glance at artwork and then we don't really sit there and think about it. And by reading this chapter, it will help you understand how to do that more and how to even just look at artwork and think about what was that artist thinking about when they were creating it? What kind of mood were they in that we could tell by the colors that they were using? Or what decade is it? So by just looking at this one, and this one is one that a lot of people have seen before, and it actually was at the Nelson down in Kansas City for a while with several other Mexican artists. And she is very well known as being one of the leading female artists at that time period. And one thing we could just tell by looking at the artwork before we would even look at the credit line, which is below the artwork or it could be on the side of it in the textbook is just what do you think the artist was meaning by this painting? What time period was it? What place is this? So there's a few things that could help us tell. Obviously this is probably not an era of today. It could be in the past and what are some of those things that could tell us? One thing that a lot of people always seem to comment on is her eyebrow. And if you think grooming has changed a lot and a lot of people don't have unibrows, this seems to be a topic a lot of times, but let's just not focus on this part. What's some other things that we are looking at? There's lots of gigantic green leaves behind her. The type of necklace that we have what does the necklace look like it's made out of? And then this cute little animal here. What's the story behind that? And as you noticed, some people are like, that's a ribbon. Some people say that's a vine. But why is this animal with her? So those are things that we could talk about when just looking at artwork. So Frida Kahlo is, this is a self-portrait with a monkey. It's was created in 1938. So that could also give you a feeling of, oh, that explains why someone may look that way, would be the time period. You could also see that it's oil on masonite. So that means it's oil painting on masonite, which is a type of board. Also, always pay attention to the size. So this is 16 inches by 12 inches, which is a little bit bigger than a notebook. Then we can see where is the artwork located. And then this will tell you when they also had it in their buildings. Then one other part, there's always a little artist thing right here. As I said, she's a Mexican artist. There are, um, movies out there that you guys could watch about her. And one other thing that a lot of people didn't know is that she was struck with polio. Then later on in life, she was hit by a bus. And that was something very tragic that happened to her because she basically broke all of her bones, but still she stayed alive and she was a person that wasn't wanting to be laid up in bed. So she was painting as little much as she could. She even would have the paintbrush in her mouth and would paint that way. So she had to reteach herself how to paint. 
and then deal with those emotions. So through all that, you can kind of tell by maybe looking at the eyes of how a person is feeling in their paintings, also through self-portraits. Then let's turn to the next page here. So when reading through the book, vocabulary will be in the dark words, just like in most textbooks. The different parts that you should be reading, and then the little bullet areas, those will help you break down of the different things. So through this, what does the word perceive mean? It means to become deeply aware through your senses of the visual objects that we're looking at. So when we were looking at the first one, that's what I was saying. Look at it. What do you think the artist was talking about, portraying? What is the meaning behind it? So by looking at this one, which is called what? Remember, look at the bottom area. It will tell you what the name of it is. It's called Bayou Tesh. And by looking at that, you can already tell it looks like it's in the swamp. I wouldn't have to look at the credit line here. You can tell by the moss in it the trees, obviously the water of the Mashi area. Bayou Tesh, if Tesh is in a bayou, is like a creek or a stream that you would find up in this area, but this would be found more in Louisiana, Mississippi, Florida, those type of areas. So by looking at this, and if we just sit there and talk about it, what was the climate like at that time? Was it cold down there? Was it warm? Really muggy? What could you be seeing? There's some people on a boat. There's two guys there and a guy there. What were they doing? Were they fishing? Were they hunting for alligators? Were they looking for their crawfish? They were trying to, you know, make an income for their family, or were they trying to feed their family? But also in that area, you can see all this moss, which is actually how the trees do look down in the south. Then we could also look at the time period. It's 1870. So this is one of the few ways of transportation, but if you live on a bayou, that is your transportation from going town to town for some people. So this artist, if we then look here, you can see is totally different style of painting. They do have some of the same color palettes where they have the sun coming in on this one. There's just a little bit of light, but it's focused on this that the artist was portraying. Also, this has lots of lines going done, which is the brush strokes that the artist was putting in there. Were they using bright, happy colors? Were they using colors, as some people would say, depressing colors because they're dull colors, they're not bright. Even the reddish brown color is not a bright. Her hair is not even bright. So what is the artist portraying in this type of picture? So if you look at the title of this, it's called Sick Child. So you can see that the artist was portraying and having you, the viewer, feel the emotion of what was going on in this painting. So looking at this book, that's what art is communicating. Look at what the artist is doing. That's what this chapter is about. Also, what are the different purposes of art? So one would be personal function. So this was portraying my own personal feelings of the sadness of this mother and child. A social function. It's something for celebration. Spiritual function. What type of artwork could be something that you still see today that's a spiritual thing? It could be, say, a stained glass window in a church or something. Here, they have a spiritual one going. If we look at this, it is not a painting. And how do we know that it's not a painting? It's not an animation still, either. We look at this. Go through here, remember, this is the credit line. It's painted earthenware, which means it's clay. So this is a 3D little thing that we're looking at. It's not a flat painting that the artist would do. And then the Pueblo scene is what this is. Corn dancers in church. So you can see 
all these different things that they have. Another function of art is physical function. So samples they have is industrial designers, new materials, architects, people even that design cars. It's for a physical function. Ceramic mugs, how does the handle feel to you? The chair you're setting in is a physical function. Educational, that's to tell a time period. How do they communicate their stories at that time? Like I said earlier, church stained glass windows. A lot of people couldn't read at that time. So they told the story of the Bible through all the pictures of the church in stained glass. And then through this one thing, um, artists have a lifelong pursuit. Ways that you can do that is through hobbies. You could have a career in art. Get involved in art programs around your area. Also, discover new tools, materials, try new things, watch some YouTube things. Just go buy some art supplies and just start messing with them. So people have a lifelong pursuit. And graphic designers still would be considered an artist. Architect people would be considered an artist. Even, like I said earlier, sculptors, they make 3D models for cars. Those would all people that have lifelong pursuits of artists. Looking at this painting, this is also one that's telling a story. So just before we look at the title down here at the bottom, what could you tell me about her? What time period is it? Was she a regular person? Was she very poor? Was she very rich? Other than the jewelry that's being shown and the fancy clothing that she has, the colors of that time period also. If you wore red and purple, and look at the time period down here, 1539 was the time period. She was royalty. She was married to Henry VIII. So you can see how adorned all of her clothing is. So that's another way paintings can tell us what things are. So flipping through this, you can also tell where do ideas, artists get their ideas. Nature would be one. So here's a couple of different nature things. This is telling you one person experienced a hurricane, one did not. So that could be the movements that the artist is using of lines, the angles or shapes of something. So this is tilted, but all the lines are going this way. Whereas if you look at this one, they're all these little trees broke going the exact same way on a postcard. So which artist do you think experienced the hurricane? I would say more of this person because they're showing the motion of having to deal with the winds of the hurricane, which can get up to 100 miles an hour or more. Down here, they were just looking at nature, telling the landscape, and also the industrial time period of this little train that was going through, of how it used to be a nice, quiet land, and now we have this going on. This person's just telling the time period. This was during the Great Depression, the American Gothic, that is still in Iowa. You can visit that little house. So it could be real world events. It could be myth and legends, which would be this type of artwork. Religious, which was this mask. It's a bird mask that they would wear for a ritual. And creative techniques. And here Jackson Pollock, and if we turn to the next page, this was his creative technique of painting. So a lot of people just think he just splattered things everywhere. He just had a plan. It just doesn't look like he had a plan. So some of these paintings were several feet by several larger feet. Some were small. But when we were looking at different artists of the past, if we look at this artist here, which is Picasso, and then we look at this artist here, Picasso was looking at the same painting, but you can see how he was portraying it a different way. Here the focus is this little girl, 
and the gigantic canvas that this artist that's in the dark that you really can't see is painting and how everybody is facing this little girl. Even the door frame of this guy is facing this little girl. If you look at this, what is Picasso saying about this painting? So the little girl, the one you notice the most. How about the guy in the back? You can't even tell now. If you notice how detailed, even though it's geometric and abstract, how tall the artist became in Picasso's. So Picasso is saying the artist is the main focus. And these people that are just very simple shapes, even the dog, don't matter. It's the artist and the canvas itself is what's mattering. And you can tell they use different colors also. So you can show your meaning of things just by simple colors too. And then the next part is the language of art. So when we talk about artwork, there's the elements of art, and that would be your line, shape, form, space, color, value, and texture. And you always use at least one of those somehow. So if we look at this, what kind of color is Janet Fish using? Bright, happy colors, dark colors, black and white. What shapes, remember, that's one of the elements. What shapes repeat all the time throughout all this? Does she show texture? Maybe by the petals and the leaves and the texture of the curtain, the smoothness of the glass, the texture of the tabletop. Is she showing space somehow? She has things up close in the middle and far in the background. If you look at this, there's also a diagonal kind of thing. If we look at the picture this way, it seems darker colors with some bright, we flip it this way, it's all bright corners in the top upper area. So that's something that the artist could do too. I bet you notice there's always something bright with something dark. She's playing off of complementary colors, which is red, green, and blue and orange, and even a little bit of yellow and purple. So she's putting all these things in the painting. You're just not realizing it as the viewer, but it's making it more eye-catching. The principles of art, which you always are using and you're not aware of it also. Over here, they have them listed. And you have the elements, remember back on this one, they are governed by the principles. So you could have balance and rhythm and movement, variety, emphasis, and harmony. So she had movements going repeatedly of what lines are. She had the movement that way, the movement here. Even as the eye is seeing something, that could be a movement that she put in there. Maybe it's the rhythm that she has. What type of balance could you have? This one, it's not very balanced here, but if you look at this one, you have one that could be almost symmetrical with just a little bit thrown off there from being symmetrical. But if you look here, curtain, curtain. Also, when we're looking at a work of art, we have the subject, composition, and the content of what someone is doing. So the subject here, just by looking at it, we know what the subject is. Person with a table, teapot, some type of food, a tree, birds, outside. That would be the subject. Here, subject would be raspberries, flowers, fish, more flowers. We could also have non-objective. So non-objective means you're not for sure what it is portraying. So they have us then turning back to page 14 here. And they're talking about this artwork right here. Non-objective, so the splatter painting or also action painting is what Jackson Pollock did. So we can't tell what the actual subject is. So going back to here, composition, it's the way things are arranged. So like we said, it could be 
you know, symmetrical. The content, it's the message of what the artist is portraying. So here, you could even read in the title, it's called The Breakfast of the Birds. So the birds are eaten, and she's, or he is eating. So the content would be a morning time with the birds. If we look at back to the first part of the chapter on page seven remember we talked about what is the content you can tell that by the picture itself but also when you're looking it's called sick child so that would be the content the content of this was the Bayou Tesh and the living of the time in 1870 The credit line, which I've been pointing out, is at the side or below the artwork. The first thing, it will always have the name of the artist, the title, and that's italicized, the year it was created, the medium, so this one here, it was what? Oil on board. So it's oil paint on some type of board that they were painting, where if it says terracotta, that would be clay. It could be watercolor, it could be color pencil. The size of an artwork. And then the location of the gallery or museum. It could even be a personal collection that it is in now. So once you are done with this, fill out the vocabulary worksheet for the L's and put the definition that's found in the book. And then you will be doing this worksheet. So turn to page nine and on page nine, you have check your understanding right here. And for that one, what does the word perceive mean? So it's italicized. So that means it's also vocabulary. So I'm going to look for where throughout the book, oh, there's the word perceive. To become deeply aware through the senses of a special nature of a visual object and write that down. Then go through the rest of it, and then here, don't do number four there, do number four here. And then go through the rest of it. When it says the elements of art, actually write the definition and write all of the elements of art. Principles, write the definition and write all the principles of art out and then continue through. And there's only a front to the worksheet. Make sure you submit the worksheet and your vocabulary because they both will be graded.